Outside Interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining me as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Matt Edmondson, who is in Liverpool in the UK. How are you doing, Matt? Yeah, really good. Really good. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on the show, John. Yeah, and uh, Matt is the managing director of Orien, and uh, and what we're going to talk about today is customer centricity, and and I like this I like this uh, topic, uh, Matt, because I see today like I mean you can if you go to anybody's website you're going to find customer centric somewhere on it right and i call those bumper stickers you know everybody yeah, is yeah. one of those things that came into vogue oh we put the customer central to everything we're customer centric but then when you engage with those uh when you engage with those companies as a customer or whatever you get it you get a very very different experience and you realize they're not customer centric mm -hmm. um, so so let's just start off with with that concept i mean if you're going to if you're going to try and be customer centric you actually have to to be customer centric as opposed to just put a bumper sticker up because then you actually um you're actually in a worse position to be honest if you if you say you're something and you're not right yeah totally i totally agree with that you know margaret thatcher famously said didn't she that um be you know be, being a leader is a lot like being a lady if you have to tell people you are one then you're not <laughs> and um and i thought it was a great and it's the same with customer centric you you don't have to tell your customers that you're customer centric and usually the first sign that you're not customer centric is you put it on your website uh we're a customer led organization which mm. for most businesses is not actually true and um a lot of people actually don't believe it now when you put yeah. that on your website there was some research done by hubspot recently uh, and there's an overwhelming percentage of people when they look at that go, that's just nonsense. We don't believe it. And so I do wonder if we do ourselves more harm than good by trying to pretend to be something that we're not. Yeah, I, I would agree with that because, I mean, I think you want and I, and I think this I think this started before the pandemic, but I think it's it's accelerated uh, during and, and uh, since is that I think people are starting to more and more look for authenticity from the companies yeah. they deal with so if uh, you know so if you say you're customer centric be customer centric then you're authentic but if you say it and you're not then you're being inauthentic and uh, and i think that's the that's the crux of it i think people are looking for for companies to be authentic to do what they say remember that old uh what was it that old ad for ron seal does what it says on the tin oh does what it says on the tin yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah i think that's what people want yeah, absolutely. I, I think I, I totally agree. I think being authentic is such a buzzword, isn't it? At the yeah. Moment? And mm -hmm. it's um, it's one of those things. What does that actually mean? Well, actually, if you're not going to be customer centric, being authentic is not trying to pretend that you are. Mm -hmm. uh, but if being customer centric is part of your strategy and is part of your focus, is part of your DNA or your culture, um, you know, part of your values, then absolutely you should totally do that with everything that you've got do what it says on the tin uh if you like and i guess for me one of the ways that you'll know if you're customer centric is how many repeat customers you have right uh, especially when you compare it to your industry average that's for me the real sort of you know metric it's like well if i am really good at customer service if i am really focused mm. on the customers then they're going to come back time and time again and if they're not there's a disconnect somewhere yeah no absolutely and i mean you can see that sometimes in the uh, do you when a customer contacts your customer service or customer support are you trying to just close the ticket and get rid of them or you're actually genuinely trying to figure out what's going on and maybe help them maybe give them additional information you know which is where mm. the customer centricity piece comes in but let's talk about um so how can you if you decide okay i want to be genuinely customer centric where are some of the what are some of the ways you should start or where should you focus that's a great question john and i think the the first place to start um with all of these things is uh with a piece of advice i think it's about two thousand years old you know one of these old pieces of advice has just stood the test of time and that is to treat other people the way that you would want to be treated and so when it comes to being customer centric, it's kind of like, well, how, if I was in this exact same situation, what would I want to happen right now? And think about whatever's happening, whatever's going on in your business, 
from a customer's point of view. And if you can do that, you are 90% of the way there. There's, do you mean, there's no real magic silver bullets or checklists, although mm -hmm. I'm sure we could probably create one and sell it to you for $99, do you know what I mean? But it's, <laughs> it's that kind of, uh, it's just an old fashioned principle. Just treat people yeah. how you would want to be treated in that same situation. And if that becomes your guiding manifesto for your customer service, I think you'll probably do quite well. Yeah, and and they 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 think there the 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 nice thing there is um, you know as you say treat people as you want to be treated because it's a it's a strange phenomenon, isn't it? Like uh, we're all we're all customers, we're all consumers, and we all have good and bad experiences. But sometimes we cross the threshold, whether it's physical or virtual, to our company, and suddenly we forget all of that and we start trying to figure out how we can make things work for us rather than the customer. The kind of thing that frustrates us when we deal with other companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. There's a great example of this. Is when we um, when we started our uh, business, uh, an e-commerce business in 2012, we moved it from Jersey, which as you all know, John, is a small mm -hmm. island off the north coast of France, uh, not New Jersey. Uh, and we, we moved it from there to Liverpool. Uh, and we made a massive switch in our business model. We decided that we would move from being um, very price driven, but poor customer service to maybe not being as price sensitive, but doing a much better customer service delivery, which meant our prices actually in reality had to go up. The first year we made that decision, our sales fell because our prices yeah. had gone up. But the year after, and this is where you have to hold on to a little bit of hope. The year after our sales rose by over 20%, because that's how long it took for that process to filter through, if that makes sense, for that decision to filter through, both from an internal point of view, uh, but for also for customers to realize this was what was going on, they'd experienced better customer service and they started to come back. And that's when our repeat customer rate started to go through the roof. So, um, yeah, it's it's a real... I mean, it made a big difference to us as a business. That's why I can sit yeah. here and talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple of things. I mean, uh, I want to ask about there, but I mean, f first and foremost, uh, I agree with you. When you do something like this, there's often a dip, and that is where you got to hold your nerve, uh, and you got to hold your nerve and make sure if you if you're firmly committed and you really believe this is the right thing to do, you got to hold your nerve during that dip. And I think that sometimes, unfortunately, people bail too early. Uh, but secondly, what, what are some of the things that you did differently um, to to create this uh, to create this new customer service um, orientation? One of the things that we did because we were a, an online business, um, we invested heavily in the staff who were doing and delivering the uh, customer service, mm -hmm. and so you, you know frontline staff. And we said to them, "Listen, you're." Here's the rules for doing customer service. You are to give people the kind of service that you would want if you were in the same situation. And in fact, we wrote it in our values, in our uh, internal value mm -hmm. statement, which said we will give customers the kind of service that we ourselves would like, but rarely encounter, which is quite mm -hmm. a true statement. I think. And so there's a, the, a classic example is a guy called Greg. I tell this story often because it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, Greg uh, was working for us. Uh, in customer service, and I'm still friends with Greg. He has since moved on. He is an unbelievably talented musician, but yeah, that's another story. And Greg was working in customer service, and a guy called uh, me on a Monday morning, uh, and he said, "Listen, I he, he called the office. I need to talk to the the CEO. I need to talk to the MD. Can I speak to whoever that is, please?" And so I end up on the phone to this guy. How can I help mm -hmm. you? Uh, and he said to me, "I want to tell you a story about Greg." And I thought, OK, it's going to be interesting. He <laughs> said, on Thursday, I ordered some product from your website. And on Friday morning, it hadn't arrived. And so I called your company to see why it had not arrived. And what had happened, John, was this guy had called up in an absolute storm because his products hadn't arrived the next day. Mm -hmm. But he'd not actually ordered the products on next day. He'd ordered them on free delivery, which takes three to five mm -hmm. days. And we were yeah. really clear on the website, right? So we could mm -hmm. have said, hang on a minute, bud. You chose a three to five day option. Give us a ring next Wednesday if they've still mm -hmm. not arrived. Um, but Greg was like, well, hang on a minute. Can I ask why is this such a problem? Uh, right. if, you, if you don't mind me asking. 
Uh, and he said, listen, because uh, it was a beauty site that we owned, right? Uh, and so it's always unusual when a chap calls you irate that the <laughs> product he orders has not arrived. <laughs> and so he um, he he said, well, listen, the re- honestly, I ordered these, and I appreciate this is my mistake, but it's my wife's birthday tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so Greg, who was recently married at this point, instantly felt all this man's pain. Uh, right. He went, oh, man, you, you can't miss your wife's birthday. That's just bang. That's just not going to go well <laughs> on any kind of level. That's not going to go well. And so Greg was like, no problem. I will resend the order out to you, uh, but I'll send it out by courier uh, next day, Saturday morning courier. Now, at the time when Greg did this, Saturday morning couriers were incredibly expensive. Right, it wasn't yeah, a cheap yeah. thing to do. Uh, and so here's this guy telling me the story. And he said, Greg sent this out. So it arrived by nine o'clock on Saturday morning. And not only did it arrive by nine o'clock, I opened the box, the chap tells me, and all the stuff inside the box has already been wrapped up. So oh, Greg wow. had gone to the warehouse and he'd got all the parts, he got all the stuff gift wrapped for this chap put it in a box. He'd got everybody in the company to sign a card for his wife saying happy birthday. And I think if memory serves me correctly, he even put a little bit of chocolate in the box. So this guy gets the parcel before nine o'clock on Saturday. Everything's wrapped. There's a card from Jersey and Greg has sorted all this out. So this guy, he's regaling this story to me. He is, well, he, Honestly, he was in tears on the phone, just right. beside himself at the service. Uh, and I was like, I worked to help John, right? This whole thing, profit-wise, I was at a massive loss. Yeah. Uh, I, I worked out on the profit on his order, how much the extras cost me. Not that I cared, but I went to Greg, and because Greg can make these decisions without approval uh, mm-hmm. up to a certain value. And I said, that was amazing. And do you know? That that guy became one of our best ever customers uh, in Jersey, yeah. and they always bought from us time and time again. And so, um, so yeah, I, this giving people the service that you would like but rarely encounter, I think, is such a good guiding principle. And that's all Greg did. It was like, if I was in this guy's shoes, what would I want? I want to I want to be able to give something to my wife yeah. on her birthday, right? And so he made it happen. Yeah, yeah, you know what? I love? There's, there's a number of things I love about this, this story, but the first thing I wanted to come back uh, uh, and ask you about is, you said he had he had the authority to do things up to a certain degree, and I think this is this is the key piece here, is if you are going to be customer centric like that, you have to trust your people and you have to give them a certain amount of you know limited or whatever autonomy yeah, to be able to make make decisions like that. So how was that? So was that a deliberate decision of, of when you were moving more into this mode? Deliberate decision to give more kind of autonomy or power to customer service. Yeah, it was. I mean, we. You, you're, you're bang on. I mean, you're totally right when you say you, you can't deliver great customer service if your customer service agents are hampered by scripts and strategies, mm. right? You just, they have to have a little bit of leeway. They have to have a bit of um, autonomy. They have to have some ability to make some decisions without having to go to somebody else because that's not customer service. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We've all experienced that. And, it's, and you sit there on the phone and you go, your standard response is, I just want to talk to your boss then. Can I just talk? And as I'm already as a customer getting really annoyed and nine times out of 10, they didn't need to talk to Greg's boss. They didn't need to talk to me. Greg was much better at customer service than I was ever going to be. So why would I not empower him uh, Mm. to do that? And I think as long as you hire staff, who are aligned to your corporate values, to your company values, who are aware of your culture as a company and are connected to that, that's the power of of hiring like that. You can give people autonomy without the risk of getting burned or ripped off or, you know, whatever people's fears is about that. Yeah, yeah, no, I really love that. There's a guy told me a great story recently. I can't remember what airline he was on, but uh, he was... uh, he loves French wine. They served him some wine. He really liked it. He said to the, he said to the cabin crew, "Oh, um, could you get me the name of that bottle? I want to buy some." And when they were landing, they just presented him with the bottle and said, "Yeah, this is our gift to you." Now it turns out that they also, he found out later, they also have the, 
the leeway to do things up to like fifty dollars or whatever when yeah. you know not all whenever with their discretion but it's those kind of things that that's su that surprising and i think that's it i think we want to be surprised and delighted mm. yeah absolutely and surprise and delight is such a powerful thing and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money um and usually the people who know how to surprise and delight are the people on the front line not the people in the boardroom right so yeah. um the 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 lady on the airplane she was on the front line she knew okay i'm just gonna give this guy a bottle of wine because i can't she knew how to surprise and delight that customer uh which is why empowering you know for us we empower we did we did the same thing uh with everybody in the warehouse we said to them listen um we came up with this concept called smocks which i i think is i still like i still smile every time i say it smocks were was an abbreviation for sexy moments of customer service. And um, we were like, listen, Smocks, everybody in the company uh, has a budget which they can spend uh, on Smocks. And if it's under that budget, you never ever have to get permission um, because we trusted our people to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's over that, come talk to us and we'll have a conversation about it, right? And so, there's a there was a lady who worked in our warehouse called Nicola who she totally she she was in the way she started to recognize people that were were ordering on a regular basis she packed the boxes she saw the names mm. and so she started to do things like just write handwritten notes to saying hey it's Nicola in the warehouse I've packed your order again I've seen you've ordered from us a few times I don't know how many times because I don't have access to all that information but you know we're a, we're a, we're a fun little company just to appreciate you buying from us and um, just to say thanks. Here's a 20 buck gift card for Starbucks or something like that. You know, she'd do that all the time. Uh, and it was phenomenal, you know, and the response was great and the customer service was great and the customers just kept waxing lyrical to me about Nicola in the warehouse. And it was it was wonderful. Yeah, and you, and you I love about that story as well is the fact that um, it, that is really empowering your whole organization and everybody feeling like they have a part to play as opposed to in a lot of organizations where, you know, there may be sales and marketing or up here, or maybe the suppliers are down or the warehouse production fulfillment is over there and never the twain shall meet and, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. But I love the way that it is spread out throughout the company because, I mean, the fact is, as humans, we're always going to default to the least best experience that we have. It doesn't matter yeah. how brilliant the rest of the experience is. It just has to be one tiny thing. And suddenly, because we're hardwired that way, we're like, oh, this was a terrible experience. And you're like, oh, well, no, one part of it was. But that's who we are. So I think empowering the whole company is critical. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I think you've got to remember, right? I'm the guy. I'm the guy in the boardroom. I'm the guy in the mm -hmm. office who is the furthest away from the customer in in, in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not dealing with them on a day to day basis, so why should I be the one which which makes all the calls about customer service? Your customers don't, and it's not like your customers just interact with one person. Uh, certainly, in our business, customers were involved with just about everybody. You know, everybody in yeah. our business was involved in some some kind of logistics or some kind of experience that the customer was going to have i needed to empower anybody in that chain you know so anybody that had any kind of connection with a customer i needed to empower so even the delivery guys i mean they work for somebody else's company so you know mm -hmm. the raw mail guys or whatever you know what we were we looked on those guys we were we were generous with those guys we gave them stuff whenever we could they take freebies from the website we why do we do that well because we want them on our side we want them to turn up every day to pick the stuff up right because it has an impact on whether our customers are happy so uh yeah everybody in that involved in that process at some point is going to have some connection with one of your customers your marketing guys on social media they're having connections with your customers so you've got to empower them i think yeah, no, I know. I, I, 100%. And I, I love the way uh, your your company has has done this. And those stories are great, because it really does show that it's looking, looking at the customers as humans and relating to them as human beings, which is what we all are at the end of the day. Um, because definitely things were, and, and still to some degree, things are going in the direction of where people like to hide behind technology rather than use technology yeah. as an enabler and as a way to, to, you know, to free you up to build those relationships. It's something to hide behind. And I love, I love the stories. I love everything you've shared today, Matt. It's been fantastic. 
Um, all of Matt's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell us more about you and Orient. I got that right, didn't I? <laughs> yeah, you did. It's like I said before we hit the record button. Uh, when we decided to name the company, we thought, let's go get one of those words that people can't spell and people can't pronounce whenever they see it written down, because mm -hmm. why would we make it easy? You know? Uh, yeah, no. So Orient's the company I'm involved in, which I just absolutely love. It's all about e-commerce. Everything we do is around e-commerce. We we have I have an e-commerce podcast. We have a done for you e-commerce service. Uh, we we just we just love what we do, if I'm honest with you, John, from a warehouse in sunny Liverpool, which is just it's just great fun. You know, I kind of have to pinch myself every day. It's uh, it's just we got great people, magic people, actually. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what we do. Uh, anything to do with e-commerce. And if anyone wants to reach out, we'd love to hear from you. You can. Uh, get a hold of me at mattedmondson.com is the website. Everything about me is there. So uh, social media links, all that sort of stuff. Be great to connect. Yeah, fantastic. And like I said, all that information will be <laughs> below this video. So listen, thanks again, Matt. Thanks uh, for sharing your perspectives. I love that. I mean, there's a lot of takeaways here for people. You can see um, to be truly customer centric. Yeah, it takes some work. But at the end of the day, it starts with a real commitment and a culture that wants to wants to help people yeah it does people in, yeah, absolutely. people in customer service who actually want to help customers there's a yeah absolutely there's a concept okay um <laughs> as i said <laughs> revolutionary it's revolutionary. revolutionary change the world yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> all right well listen thank you matt thank you for watching and listening and i'll see you all again soon thank you thanks